Good morning, everyone. So today is what we normally refer to as Gaudete Sunday. It's a Latin word for rejoice, and it comes from the second reading. You know how we're on a three-year three cycle for all the readings, so we hear most of the gospel within three years. For the third Sunday of Advent, for every single year, we always have within the first couple of words of the second reading, the word rejoice. And so the reason we call this Rejoice Sunday or Gaudete Sunday is because it's meant to be a joyful day, a day of rejoicing. So the pink candle that we just lit, the pink cloth on the altar, and even the pink rose vestments that we use as the priest for the liturgy, it's meant to be a mixing of this kind of, if you want to call Advent a little Lent, this sense of like waiting and anticipation, anticipation, sorry, I can't talk this morning, and this penance, sense of penance mixed with the coming of the Lord, the nearness of the Lord, so this joy of what's to come, so the, the penance of the now and the joy of the, the not yet, and it all comes together today and is mixed into the purple and white of penance and joy into pink rose. Anyway, so that's the whole pink theme that we have going on today. But I think it's a good description to say that today is Gaudete Sunday or Rejoice Sunday or Joyful Sunday because today we are joyfully waiting for the Lord because he is very near to us. And really this is the joy of Advent, the joy of every day that Jesus Christ is very near to us and is drawing nearer every day. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you, said the angel to Mary. It is the nearness of God which makes the virgin rejoice, and the nearness of the Messiah will make the unborn Baptist show forth his joy by leaping in the womb of Elizabeth. And the angel will say to the three wise men, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. There's that joy that we keep hearing throughout the Gospels. And in fact, we also hear throughout the Gospels of a bunch of people, crowds of people always coming to gather around Christ all the time. Inevitably, that crowd is going to include children and my experience with kids, granted limited, but it, we have a school that is very, very active. But my experience is they don't really go around people who are grumpy or upset or curmudgeonly. They're attracted to joy, happiness. And so I can only imagine what joy Christ himself must have exuded when he was talking to the crowds of people. Obviously not the Pharisees or scribes, they're a separate bunch, but for the rest of the people, how joyful he must have been. What kind of in interaction and memories would have been lasted and imprinted on the people that surrounded Christ? Joy. The church reminds us today to rejoice, and we have good reason for doing so, because the Lord is near. We can come close to him whenever we want, but it is very much us that have to make the effort. Christ is already here, right next to us, waiting for us to turn to him, always waiting there. But we have to turn. We have to make some small little effort to come to him, however small. Because more than anything, he respects our freedom, our will. He will never force it on us. The joy that he offers, he offers freely. He always offers freely. As humans, though, we're not always joyful. We're not always happy. In the spiritual life, very specifically the spiritual life, maybe you've experienced this, but there's this times of highs and lows in the spiritual life. St. Ignatius of Loyola identifies these highs as consolation and these lows as desolation. Consolation is where, you know, saying prayers every single day is easy as anything. 
getting up first thing in the morning to come to an early morning mass is easy. Um, going about being happy is easy. Being joyfully is easy. Constantly talking to God is easy. And desolation is the exact opposite. I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to Mass. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I got other things I got to do. Every excuse in the book, not even to say a simple Our Father. A lot of times people think that desolation, that period of lowness in the spiritual life, is means that we're away from God, far from God. But that's not true. In periods of desolation, we're not far from God. God never moved. Maybe we think he has, but he hasn't. In fact, what happens though is, and if anyone's been through RCIA or anything like this, you're probably going to understand this a little bit if you're not already further along in this. But when we first come to know Christ, and I don't mean really know him, I don't mean as a child, because children have a different experience of God than adults. But as adults, when we come to know Christ very, very personally and intimately, we end up being on this like spiritual high. It's like, oh, I love Jesus. I, I, anything for Christ, I want everything. I want to do whatever he wants. Whatever God wills, I'll do it. And that lasts for a long time until finally it starts to come down. And it's like, I don't want to do it. I'm tired. I got other things. The thing is, though, that when we come into this desolation, and if we haven't been there, we will, trust me. But it's not, uh, it's not bad, it's not terrible, it just is. The reason for this, though, is because when we're in consolation, things are easy. But God wants to make sure that we love him for who he is, and not because of that consolation that's there. And so he will remove that consolation from us. He will remove that joy and that happiness and that ease of the spiritual life. He does it, again, not to punishment, punish us. That's not his intention. His intention is to make sure that we actually love him and not just that joy that he's been giving us. Imagine a friend whom you let use your car whenever they need. And so they're, they're friendly with you. And they, you seem like a good person. But if they only ever talk to you about that car and the need of the car, and they don't ever speak to you elsewise, are they really a friend? And if you take that car away and they never show back up, are they really a friend? So that's, how it, that's the, an example of how we understand God's work in the spiritual life. To go from consolation to desolation is not a punishment, but it's almost like a test, like, hey, do you really love me or do you just love this happiness that I keep giving you? All that to say is it's okay if we're not happy in the moment. It's okay if we're in the period of desolation in our spiritual lives. But there is something that we need to know. Desolation does not mean, it should not be our baseline. It should not, should not be the norm in our life. In fact, the quickest way to get out of desolation more than anything else, the quickest way to get the height of that spiritual life again is to not to change a thing in your prayer life. Don't move it an inch. If you agreed with God to be praying the rosary every single day when you were in consolation, and you were, and it was great, and then you're like, oh, I'm tired, I don't really feel like it, the quickest way to get out of that desolation is to continue to pray that rosary. Or morning prayer, if you're not doing rosaries, it's fine. You don't have to. I highly, highly encourage it, as I would assume there's a big group there that would encourage it too. But prayer, sticking to it, whatever spiritual practices we had at the height of our spiritual life, we stick to in desolation because as soon as we start to go down, that constant contact with God is what's going to reanimate our soul, reanimate that love for God that we originally had. My brothers and sisters, today is Gaudete Sunday. It's a day of rejoicing, of joy, of happiness. If we're in a period of consolation, if we're in that period of happiness, good. Go and share it with everybody. You have an obligation. And if you're not, 
Stick to your prayers. It's what's going to see you through. Back to Christ. Back to joy. Back to the fullness of happiness that he offers us freely. God bless you.